Hi, I'm Lisa, and welcome to Bethel Online. We're so glad that you joined us today. And in the comfort of your home, whether you're in pajamas or you're dressed up, either way, we're glad that you joined us. We hope that you um, enjoy the service as Pastor talks about healing our home and our worship team. Y'all have a good day. Good morning, church. Let's worship our God, a God of impossible things. Whatever you're going through, let's give it to him and just worship him. He's an overcomer, so through him, we are also overcomers. incredible things we worship you this morning dear God and one thing that we want to do is just invite our father God into our homes invite his presence into your household this morning invite him there with your family let's worship him and just give everything to him let him change the atmosphere in your home 
through that, there's so many amazing things that can happen. And just His presence is something we all need to experience. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare your our living hope. Your presence. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free. And my shame is undone Your presence Holy Spirit, you are
The following is paid programming brought to you by Marriages Against Technology. Before, our relationship was just a tangled mess of push notifications, interruptive chimes, farm animal games, and, and secret GPS tracking. I was checking Nancy's Facebook page just to see where she was at. Physically and emotionally. And I was fortifying my manhood by playing violent video games in which I was a sniper trying to save all of America. Waffle Daddy 16 is down. Give him a med kit. Bravo. They're on your six! They're on your six! Frag out! Frag out! I just wanted him to take out the trash. Don't look at me! I had a hard time communicating how I felt. He'd try these little emoticons, but the messages got mixed. I have fat thumbs, and one slip to the right, and you are sending a totally different message. It got to the place where I was finding attention elsewhere. Oh, come on. Come on! We were talking about separating. And by separating, we mean buying an additional tablet so we could each have one. The point is that we were chewing up our data with nothing to show for it. And that's when we discovered unplugging. unplugging. It's a form of communication that requires no electricity or Wi-Fi. It was awkward. We were just sitting on the sofa, the two of us, no devices. The eye contact alone was, can I even say this on TV? We were talking without the football score dinging on his phone. For her, it used to be words with friends, but now it's words. With me. Unplugging has revolutionized the way we relate to each other. When the electricity goes out, I don't even flinch. And when I say flinch, I mean lose my everlasting mind. I know they're skeptics, but all I say is give it a shot. It's worth your time. You will see results. And fast. The most common side effects from unplugging include jitters, twitches, and withdrawals. If you experience other mental disturbances, take a walk in the sunlight. If you have a conversation that lasts more than four hours, don't see a doctor. This is normal. Just keep talking. Unplugging may not solve all your relational issues. Your overspending habits are an entirely different topic, and we don't have time for it. Unplugging. See if it's right for you. It was right for us. Good morning and God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. We have so enjoyed this opportunity to be able to come into your home and minister and encourage you while you are sitting there in your pajamas, drinking your coffee and enjoying the time with your family. Hasn't this been good that you're able to do church at home and, and spend time with your family? I know I've heard some, as many of you say that you've enjoyed it and it's been a blessing, but I sure do miss being together. I sure do miss seeing you and greeting you and hearing your laugh and feeling your embraces and sensing your love. And so uh, we look forward to that day. The way it looks here moving forward over these next few weeks, the next few days we might hear that there's some changes happening. So keep that in prayer. Uh, we're looking forward to having everybody back at church uh, as soon as possible. Uh, and so before uh, we go any further, we're going to receive our offering. This is our practice. This is our habit uh, that we have every single Sunday. And just because we're not here doesn't mean we don't get to do that. And so it really is a privilege. It really is an honor uh, to give. And so I hope uh, that you, if you're part of our church family, that you will uh, log on to our website, BethelSanAngelo.com, and uh, click the giving tab, and you can make your contribution there 
or uh, if you choose to mail it in, mail it into our P.O. box, or if you want to drop it by our, our church office or our home, that's perfectly fine. Uh, we will be happy to, to receive it. And so if you're not part of our church family and you want to do that, or maybe you've done that over these past few weeks, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You don't, you don't know how much it blesses us to be able to, to receive a gift from you, knowing that you're not part of our church. You're not obligated to us in any way, shape, or form, but uh, you, you choose to bless us. And thank you, thank you so much uh, for your generosity and faithfulness. I know you can't give during the service, but after service, if you just click the, ca uh, the giving tab on the, on the comments uh, list, and, and you, you'll, it'll take you right to our, to our website so that you can give. Let me share a little bit of what's happening, uh, what's been happening in our church these past, this past week. So on Wednesday, uh, one of our, our projects that we have to minister to our community, remember, our goal is to bring healing to our land. That's, that's our desire. That's our emphasis. And so we desire, decided to do something uh, for our community, especially our, our health care workers. You know that many of them are under a lot of stress and under a lot of pressure with everything that's been going around and we just wanted to acknowledge their efforts we wanted to acknowledge their sacrifice and their time and so what we did our church we partnered with chick-fil-a on knickerbocker here in san angelo and cc's pizza here in here in san angelo we got together and we took lunch to the community Community Medical Associates uh, here in San Angelo. That's the, the clinics uh, on Executive Drive right next to Community Hospital. So we took uh, lunch to them in a, in a small gift. You'll see some images here in regards to, to what we did. Uh, and so all we did was just we were there. We prayed with some of them. We were glad to be able to, to lend, a, lend a, a, a word of encouragement and acknowledgement for their time and, and sacrifice. Let me, let me say this real quick because... If you have somebody in your family who's, who's in the medical field, you know what they're going through. You know what they're experiencing. And, and many of them, they're, they're in a high-stress situation at work because they don't know if somebody's going to come in who's sick with the COVID-19 and, and, and infect them. And so they're nervous. And some of them, they come home and they change out of their work clothes to their their house closed outside of their house. Uh, they have a tent where they change there and they, then they go inside because they don't know if their clothes that they have is contaminated or anything like that. So that's, that's high stress for them and high stress for their family. And so we want to thank all our medical workers, all our medical uh, caregivers. Uh, we honor and uh, respect the sacrifice that you are making. And so that's what we did this week. We went out and we just ministered to them. We encouraged them and we continue to lift them up in our prayers. And so because you gave, because you were able to give through your offerings, we were able to be a, of a blessing to this part of our community uh, here in San Angelo, and we look forward to continuing to be a blessing to our community, continuing to bring healing to our land. And so I encourage you, please partner with us. Join us as we continue to reach out uh, to uh, friends and family and neighbors uh, around our city. So this is what we're going to do before we receive our offering. We are going to uh, quote our scripture in 2 Chronicles 9, 6 through 8. Uh, I'm going to read it out loud, and I want you to read it out loud with me. And then we're going to make our declaration based on that scripture. Anytime you make a declaration based on the word of God, it is true and faithful. So we're going to do that today. So 2 Chronicles 9, 6 through 8. Follow along with me. It says, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That is the word of God, and we're going to make a declaration based on that word. Follow along with me. And it reads like this. I am sowing generously. I do not give grudgingly or under compulsion. I am a cheerful giver. God loves me, and I love God. And God will bless me, so that in all things, at all times, I will have all that I need. Let's pray for the offering today. Father, I thank you for the commitment, the generosity, 
the love and the sacrifice of every individual, Lord, who has been faithful to the ministry, has been faithful to your word, being obedient and showing their love, Lord. I pray that you would bless them generously. Bless them abundantly, Father God, as they give to the ministry of this church. We are so grateful for their love and sacrifice. And because they give, Lord, we are able to reach out to others and encourage, Lord, and bringing joy and meeting needs around our city and in our community. Father God, bless this offering as we receive it today and, and during the remainder of this week. We honor and we worship your precious name. Amen and amen. Once again, thank you. Thank you for giving. And after the service, if you'll click the, the link on the comments section, that'll take you to our website. I do have one quick announcement that I want to share with you uh, to encourage you. I had mentioned earlier that I, I, it looks like, like we might be getting back to normal here in the next few weeks. I don't, we, we really don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty. But it looks the conversations kind of seem to be leaning that way from our, our state leaders and, and local leaders. And so this is what I would, would love for our church to experience once we get back together. Some of you have not gotten baptized in water. Some of you have not taken that your next step in regards to your commitment to God in, in, in your faith. And so what I'm asking you to do is one, when we get together, uh, we would love to have a, a service where we just baptize people uh, and, and, and take that next step. So if that's you, if you haven't gotten baptized and you want to get baptized, please let us know in the comments section. You can, you can message us. You can uh, call me. You can email me. Uh, and so we'll, we'll get that information to you and talk to you so we can set up a uh, uh, water baptism service for, for some of you. Uh, we'd love for you to be part of that, and, and especially as we go back and we have a, an, a, a, a great celebration being back together. So that's a quick announcement that I have for you, and we're going to get started with our sermon today. So let's pray and ask the Lord to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our minds to receive his word today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you because you are so good. Lord, and, and even in times like this, uh, your peace and your joy and your strength are so evident and real, Father God. And I pray, Father God, that you would continue to overwhelm us with that peace, that joy, and your spirit and your power over our lives. Lord, today, as I share your word, I, I pray that you would give me wisdom and understanding to communicate it clearly and effectively and let every heart and mind, uh, eye and ear be open to receive your word, to understand it and to apply it to their lives. I pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. As we spoke last week, we started a sermon series titled Heal Our Homes. Uh, we want God to bring healing to our homes uh, in our church. And last week I mentioned uh, that the vision of our church is to build strong families. That's, that's what we believe God has called us to do, to strengthen the family. Because I know this, and I, I believe this with all my heart, that if we have a strong home, it, it's, it's going to help us to have strong churches and communities. And, and if, if your home is healthy, it doesn't matter what's happening around, you can always go home. If your home is strong, it doesn't matter what problems at work, at school, you can always find, go home and find refuge and peace and hope. But when things aren't good at home, no matter what's happening around, you don't want to go home. How, how late can you stay out? How, how many nights can you spend at your friend's house, at your neighbor's house without having, you're going to have to come home. And we want to fix this. We want to work in our homes and we need healing in our homes. And what I told you is the vision of our church is to, uh, Build strong families. The vision of our church is to build strong families. And the way we're going to do that is by having faith in Christ, acknowledging, it, acknowledging him as our Lord and Savior, and obeying his word that he's given us, and being empowered by the Holy Spirit. So as you have faith in Christ, and as you obey his word, then you will be able to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to heal your home. And that's what we really want. And so last week, we started just, just to give you a little bit of a, of a backdrop of what we did last week so we can set a good foundation and we can start rolling down. Uh, we, we used the scripture in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Listen to this. Don't be drunk with wine, which will ruin your life, but be filled with the Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine, which will ruin your life. And how many, how many of you know that lives and homes have been ruined by alcohol? 
I mean, lives, I mean, just, people have died, people, marriages have fallen apart, businesses because of alcohol. Because alcohol is a control, control substance, and so is the Spirit. The Spirit of God can control you. And so we, we learn how kind of this works in our lives. And in Ephesians, the Apostle Paul uses alcohol. And then again, in Galatians, he doesn't use alcohol, but he, use our, he uses our sinful nature, how we can be controlled by the sinful nature, which leads to division and contempt and quarreling, or we can be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, this is what it says. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Wouldn't you love to live in a home where there is peace and joy, when there is gentleness, where there's, where there's a self-control instead of being controlled by the flesh where there's quarreling and, and all these evil and bad things. And so we, we asked you and we, uh, we prayed that God would lead you through the Holy Spirit. And then in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, let's listen to this. Those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. And so something that happened last week that I think some of you felt is like, okay, you say, Pastor, well, I do want to be controlled by the Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit to control me, but, but it seems that I keep messing up. I, I, I really try, and I try my best, and, and I keep messing up. And so one of the things that I want you to understand is that it's a process. It's a process. Notice to what Paul says here in Galatians 24, once again, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. So it's a process of dying to ourselves. It's a process of crucifying our, our sinful nature, all those bad attitudes, all those fears, all those bad words, all, all that resentment and and bitterness, you nail it on the cross. It's a process of dying to ourselves. Jesus Christ said it this way in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Listen to this. Then he said to them, whoever wants to be my, my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. So here's a key. Take up your cross daily and follow me. So here's, here's where I think many of us are having a struggle with this, with, okay, well, I'm a Christian, but I still struggle. I, I still wrestle with anger and fear and lust and all, all these bad things of the sinful nature. Here's, here's what I want you to understand. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are saved. You are going to heaven. That very moment, when you accepted him, and we're going to give you an opportunity today after, the, after I finish preaching, uh, preaching to accept Jesus Christ. The moment you do that, you're saved. You're going to go to heaven. Okay? But here's the, here's the key. We're not in heaven yet. We're still here. We're still here. And so we need to deal with life through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the way we do that is by denying ourselves, by taking our cross daily. Daily dying to ourselves. Many of you have crosses in your, in your house, maybe in your neck. Maybe you have a wall full of or crosses, and, and they're pretty, and they're nice, and that's okay. But to be honest with you, the cross in Jesus' time, in biblical times, it was, it was an instrument of torture. It was an instrument of pain. It was an instrument of death. It wasn't pretty. Now, we've made it pretty, but it wasn't. And so when, when the apostle or, or Jesus Christ says to carry your cross, it means to die. It's to die daily, to die to those passions and let the Holy Spirit have more and more control in your life. So it, it's a process. Understand that. If you feel like, and the devil may be whispering to you, you're a failure. You're no good. Look at you. You call yourself a Christian. You go to church and you still lose your temper. Guess what? We all do. We all mess up. We're, we're, it's a process. Some of us have let God control us a little bit more. Some of us need to let God control us just a little bit more. And so it's a process. And so our vision is to build strong families, and we do it through faith in Christ, obeying his word, and being empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so today, what I want to speak to you about is marriage. That's, that's going to be our first topic as we seek the Holy Spirit to bring healing to our homes and use us to bring healing. We want healing in our marriages. 
Now, anytime we talk about marriage or that I talk about marriage, I kind of get this impression, and it may be just, it may be me, but I get this impression that some people just go like, boop, I'm going to turn him off. Because I'm not interested in marriage, whether, whether you've been divorced, you've had a bad marriage, or you're having a bad marriage, and, and maybe some of the guys are saying, oh, man, he's going to preach about marriage. He's going to just make me feel bad all over again because I'm, I'm not a good husband. And maybe you just turn me off, or maybe, maybe you're like 16 or 17, and you have no desire to get married right now. Eventually you will, and so you're like, I don't want to hear about marriage. I'm young, or, or there's different reasons, or maybe some of you may say, marriage, I, I need to hear this, and maybe you're excited about this, and let me tell you this, marriage is important for all of us, whether you're married or whether you're not, you know somebody that's married, and it can help you to help them in their marriage, to encourage them, to challenge them, and so uh, please don't, don't tune me out, don't face me out, and I, uh, before I, I begin the, the, the preaching here, uh, I want to let you know that as our church our vision is to build strong families, and one of the things that we do is we have a tool for those of you who are wanting to get married. It's an online assessment. Uh, those of you who are wanting to get married, it's a premarital online assessment, and maybe you're married and you're kind of struggling in your marriage. You need some help. You can also take this assessment, and, and what it is is you, you get together with your spouse, with your partner. You take this assessment. You get the results, and we receive them. And then we, we meet with you and we talk about those results and it kind of gauges you in about uh, nine areas, communication, intimacy, finances, habits, uh, uh, how, you, uh, how you deal with friends and family members. And so, so there's different things. And trust me, this is really, really good. It's a really good tool that, that we use. Uh, uh, there's a couple in our church that we had just finished going through this, through this assessment. I had met with them several times, and we, they were getting ready to get married. As a matter of fact, their, their wedding was supposed to be on uh, the 18th of this month, and we couldn't have their wedding. And yeah, they were bummed. Yeah, they were sad. And I called them and I prayed for them and we met. And, and so we rescheduled the wedding date. And they did something really interesting that, that I want to share with you. See, they could have been bitter and resentful for what's happening. They could have been, been mad at God, but, but they made it fun. They, they, they reset the date and they resent out some invitations. They, they re, reposted the date and they took some really neat, really neat pictures uh, that, I, that you're seeing right now of them uh, just... Uh, inviting people to the wedding. As a matter of fact, they told me to invite all of you to the wedding. You are all invited to the wedding. And I'm sure that they're in their bedroom right now, scared to death that I'm inviting everybody to the wedding. No, not everybody's not invited to the wedding, okay? If you didn't receive an invitation. Now, they are receiving gifts, okay? So if you want to send the gift, they're more than happy to receive it. And they're a beautiful couple, but they made the best out of the situation. They took this assessment. They've grown through it. And they're better for it. And I believe that they're going to be better even because of this. And so I encourage you, if you're wanting to get married or struggling in your marriage, send us a message. We'll, we'll help you with this uh, assessment. Uh, and uh, we, can, we can move forward in this process. So let's begin with the Word of God today. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So here, we're going to go way back to talk about marriage. We're going to go to the very beginning when God created mankind. And so we see God forming Adam from the dust of, of the earth, and he formed him, and he, bre he blew into his, into his nostrils, and he received new life. And so what, what that means is that we are spiritual beings we, we're not accidents in, in the evolution of, of life. We're not coincidences. We are spiritual beings created with the breath of God in our lives, enabling us to be, to be partners with him, enabling us to have a relationship, and, a relationship with him. And I want you to understand that. You're not an accident. You're not a coincidence. This is not the process of evolution or something like that. This is a divine ordained relationship that God has established between man and and him as he blew breath into his life. Now, if you read the creation story, you're going to see that every time that God did something, when he created the, light, the, the darkness and the lights and the birds, and he said, and it was good, and it was good. But when he created man, he said this in Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. 
I will make a helper suitable for him. So God created Adam, and God realized, wait, it's, it's not good. I mean, everything else was perfect, but on this area, I kind of, there's something lacking. This man needs a woman. This man needs a companion, something, somebody to come alongside him and help him and, 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 you, and, and encourage him and uplift him. And, and, so, and so what he did in Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, listen to this. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs from the side, closed up the, pl the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. So here's the creation story. God created Adam, breathed life into him, his breath, his spirit, and, and, and now he creates Eve out of, out of the rib of Adam. And so this is something really important that I want to share with you. See, God didn't create a woman from a toe, uh, from Adam or from somebody, somebody uh, at top of, uh, of his head because he didn't want women to be under men or above men. He wanted women to walk beside men. That, that's where our wives be, uh, belong, men. Not underneath us, not above us, but be, uh, right beside us as we serve God, as we work in our homes and our families. And so here's, here's life. They're newlyweds. Remember when you were a newlywed? Remember in your honeymoon? Everything was perfect. You were enjoying life. And there was no worries, no concerns. And, and that's the life that Adam and Eve had. And so the, their, their job was this. Name the animals and have babies. That was their job. That was their concern. I mean, and how, how hard is it? You know, Adam was naming naming. The animals, the, the donkeys, one he called the, the Jack, and, and the female he called Jenny. The bears he called Boar, the Sal. The cat, he called him a Tom and Queen. The cow, he calls him Bull and Cow. The chicken, Rooster and Hen. The deer, Buck and the Doe. The dog, he calls him Dog. And, well, we won't go with that other part. Um, but he named them all. He named all the animals. And how hard was that? So they were enjoying life. And that's how God wants our marriages to be. God's plan is for our marriages still to be peace and joyful, enjoying communion and fellowship and growing together and learning together and working together. But something happened that messed things up. Something happened that messed things up. And so we're going to read it in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Listen to this. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to them, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. This is the introduction of sin into the world. This is the introduction of sin and disobedience into the perfect relationship that God had established. Now, I want you to understand this. Marriage is God's idea. Marriage is God's idea. It, it, it's not our idea. It, I mean, as a matter of fact, I think we've messed it up more than, more than uh, uh, made it even better. But it, marriage it was the first institution that God established before government, before education, before even the church was even established, God placed marriage. And so it is holy. It is special in the sight of God. And sin had come in to mess it up. Sin had come in to mess it up. Now let's continue to read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 11. And he said, Who told you you were naked? 
Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate it. So here's what's happening. Okay, so they're living this perfect life in paradise, literally in paradise, not having a worry or a concern, not having any issues. I mean, they have perfect communication, perfect intimacy with one another, and just working in harmony and enjoying life and having fellowship with God. God would come down and walk with them and talk with them. That is awesome. But sin came in and it messed them up. It messed things up. And so let me just give you some, some effects of sin in regards to this story. Some effects of sin and see how they affect our own marriages. See how they affect our own marriages, how sin affects our marriages. And so the effect of sin in this particular situation was guilt, shame, and fear. Guilt, shame, and fear came. They had never experienced guilt they had never experienced fear and they had never experienced shame. All of a sudden, because they sinned against God, they experienced that in their marriage. Can you imagine just enjoying life and, and being happy and, and prosperous? And all of a sudden you're like, wait, what? We're naked? Wait, what? We, uh, and you start covering themselves. They had no issues before that. It's, the Bible says, we read it previously, that they were naked and they were okay with it. But then all of a sudden, sin comes in. And they're made aware of their flaws. They're made aware of their imperfections, of their failures. And they feel guilt, shame, and fear. You know, and that's a lot like our marriages. I think a lot of marriages are facing guilt, shame, and fear. Sin has come in. We, we're still in a fallen world, people. We're still here. And we're still just like Adam and Eve from the very beginning. And we're experiencing guilt, shame, and, and fear. And so here's what happens in my marriage Here's what might happen in your marriage. Every time we face guilt, what we do is we blame. We blame somebody else. When we're guilty, when we've done something wrong, we always say, well, if you hadn't done that, and that's what Adam and Eve did. Adam was guilty, and he said, well, the woman, and the woman said, well, the serpent. We always try to blame somebody else. We always try to blame, and we, we tell our spouses, well, if you hadn't done that, I wouldn't do this. And if you hadn't said that, I wouldn't have gone there. And so it's just, it's just a blame game because we're guilty, because we're sinners, because we're sinners. And that's why you always blame somebody else for something that, that happened. And when there's shame, you try to cover it up. And that's what Adam and Eve did. They felt shame because they were naked, and so they try to cover up with, with, with fig leaves and, and try to hide, hide their shame. And we do the same thing. We, we're, they're shame, and so what we do is we cover up. And what, the, what we do is we are never honest with our spouse. We are never honest. We always kind of beat around the bush. We always kind of circle around the real issue, the real matter. And, and your, your husband may ask you, are you mad? You're like, no, I'm okay. But you know, there's, he knows there's something wrong, and you know there's something wrong, but you don't want to be honest with each other, so you just cover it up by, by being busy, by uh, getting hobbies, and going to the gym, and working extra hard, and playing with the kids, and working in the garden, and there's nothing wrong with any of that. But sometimes we use all that to cover up our shame, to cover up our, our faults, and we feel guilty for something that we've done. And then there's fear. To the matter is, we're all afraid of, some, of something or another. And when, you're, when, you're, when there's fear, what you do is you protect. You protect yourself. Because I'm afraid and I'm not going to let anybody hurt me. I'm not even going to let my wife. I'm afraid or that, that she's going to hurt me. I'm afraid that he's going to hurt me. So what you do is that you protect. And one of the ways that I've seen in marriages that we protect is by being selfish and being prideful. See, when you're selfish, all you're doing is worrying about yourself. You're, you're, you're just protecting yourself, and you're being selfish, and, you're, and when you're proud, you kind of elevate yourself above everybody else, and that is one of the worst things that you can have in marriage. And you do that all the time. You're selfish, and you say, well, if she, if she hadn't done that, I, 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 I wouldn't have done it. But, but because she did it, then I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to be there. I'm not going to help. I'm not going to. And you become prideful. And that, that burns at marriage. It eats marriage alive. That's what sin does. And we need to understand that, couples. 
We need to understand that husband. You need to understand that wife. That because of sin, our marriages are crumbling. They're falling apart. And so here's what happens. Not only do we have guilt, shame, and fear, and among other stuff, but it causes separation. It causes separation from God, and it causes separation from each other. Because when there's sin, it's hard to be intimate. When it's, there's sin, it's hard uh, it's for us to be together. When there's guilt, shame, and fear, it's hard for us to be with each other. So it separates us. We may sleep in the same bed. We may live in the same house. We may drive the same cars. But we're never together. We we'll always find an excuse. She sits over there. I sit over here. She goes to bed early. I go to bed late. And I get up early. And she gets up late. And, and we're, we're, we're always finding a place where we're never together. Because there's that guilt, shame, and fear because of sin. But it also separates us from God. With Adam and Eve, what happened, because they sinned, God said, you got to leave. You, you have to leave the garden. And, and he kicked them out of the garden. And, and you know the consequences. They had to work for their food and, and labor pains and all that, all that stuff. And so it created a separation between them and between God. And it creates a separation between us, our spouses, and between God. And so what do we do? Where do we go from here? I know that I'm a sinner. I know that, that I mess up all the time. So what do I do? Let me read you. John 3, 16. We're going to be reading all the way to verse 21 if you've got your Bibles open. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Let me pause right there. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. See, God's not after you. God doesn't want to punish you. Jesus doesn't want to condemn you. He wants to save you. Some people feel like, well, religion, all it does is it's condemnation and it's fear. No, no, it's about love and forgiveness. If, if that's what you believe about religion or relationship with God, then you've been at the wrong church. Because the God that I serve is a God of second and third and fourth and many, many chances of forgiveness because he wants to forgive us. He doesn't want to condemn us. Verse 18, listen to this. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Again, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God, God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. And so the scripture says that we have Jesus Christ, and if we believe in him, we have the forgiveness of our, uh, of our sins. It says, but you have an option. You can continue to live in sin, in darkness, or you can come into the light. And that is your choice. That is your choice. No, nobody else forces you to do that. So you can continue to let your marriage crumble and fall and, and deteriorate because of our sin. Or you can come to Jesus and receive the forgiveness of our sins. And so this is what happens when we let Jesus come into our lives. When we let Jesus forgive uh, Cleanse us and wash us of all our sins. In Romans chapter 5, verse 10, listen. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more have been, re been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? So here's what happens. When, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are reconciled with God. You, are, you, you make up with God. Remember, sin separates us from God. Sin, cause, sin causes shame, guilt, and fear, and it, and it distances us. And so what happens is, through Jesus Christ, we are reconciled with God. So I want to use this, this picture. This is you, and this is your spouse. And God is up here. Through Jesus Christ, we receive reconciliation, which means that we can draw close to God. We can get close to God. And notice what happens. As we get close to God... We are getting closer to each other. We are becoming more intimate. We are, we are ignoring the fears and the doubts and the hurts and the, 
and the shame and the guilt, and we are moving closer to forgiveness in a relationship not only with God, but with each other. I know this, people, because I know it because I've lived it in my own life. See, the reason my marriage is what it is is because I've been able to draw closer to God, and so has my wife. Now, we're not here yet, but we're, we're getting closer Every day, every week, every month, we move a little bit closer to God. And there's sometimes we, we mess up. Mess, most of the time, it's me. Okay, We mess up. We kind of fall back a little bit. But we get back up and we, we repent and we ask Jesus to help us. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit and we keep moving closer and closer. So wherever you're at, maybe you're over here or maybe you're somewhere up here. It doesn't matter. Continue to seek the reconciliation that can only come through Jesus Christ with the Father. Let me read this last scripture to you. 2 Corinthians 5, 18. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed us the message of reconciliation. Here is the key for healing our homes. As you are reconciled with God, as you are drawing close to him, he gives you the ministry of reconciliation, which means it is your job to reconcile your family, to reconcile your spouse, your wife, your husband to God. And so that's where it comes. Maybe you're, you're reconciled and you're moving and your husband is and it's your job, wife, to come to him, babe, you need Jesus in your heart. Let me pray for you, and let's pray together. And that's where it comes, and you're reconciling your home, you're reconciling your, your, your family to draw closer to God. So this is what we're going to do right now. We're going to pray. We're going to do something that may, be seem, may seem a little bit awkward and, and just odd for some of you. But I'm going to ask mom and dad, if mom and dad are home, I'm going to ask mom and dad to sit together. And, and maybe you're sitting, mom, one of them sitting up there, the other one's sitting over here. And so get close to each other. And don't, don't be saying, well, I'm over here, you come. No, no, no. Humble yourself. Remember, it's not pride or selfishness. Take the next step. Get, get close to each other. Because I want to pray for you. And if the kids are there, and if you're able to hold hands, if you're able to make a circle, just, just we, we want this to be a little bit intimate together in your own home. We want to pray for the home. Because if the marriage isn't working, man, it, it's going to be hard for the other stuff to be, to be moving forward. And so let's pray right now. Would you hold hands with your spouse right now? Father, I worship you today. Lord, and I know that the plan that you had for Adam and Eve at the very beginning, for them to enjoy life and enjoy it abundantly in peace and in harmony, that plan is still in effect for us. But sin has caused us to stumble and bumble and fall and hurt each other. We feel guilt and shame and fear in our lives. And that causes us to be distant from each other. But today, we pray, Father, through the name of Jesus Christ, that you would forgive us of all our sins. Ask him right now. Ask him for yourself. Say, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me for my sins, for my, for my selfishness, for my pride, for my shame, for, my, for me rebelling against the, your plan for our home and our marriage, God. Forgive me, Father God, and I pray that you would help me be a better husband. I pray that you would help me be a better wife, that we would draw closer to you. And as we draw closer to you, we would draw closer to each other. Father God, and as we are reconciled with you, let us also reconcile our family with you bring our children our grandchildren those we love and care for closer to you father i bless you and i thank you for everything that you're doing holy spirit we need you in this process we need you in this process of building strong families and strong marriages i ask that you would move in every home today in the name of jesus we pray amen and amen thank you thank you for joining us today and I hope that this time of prayer would not be just something that you do on Sunday morning, but spend time praying together Dur during the week, during, during the day. Uh, just pray for each other. It doesn't have to be sophisticated or eloquent. Just hold your spouse's wife and say, God, we need you. We need you desperately. And make that a prayer every single day as you seek reconciliation with God and with each other. We love you. We miss you. We look forward to seeing you once again. If there's anything we can do, please let us know. Uh, let us know in the comments. 
Again, for those of you wanting to take that assessment, uh, for those of you want to get married or, or having issues in your marriage, we want to help you in that process. Once again, we love you. God bless you. And we'll see you next week.